Salim, events keep unfolding at a lightning pace, and the most recent one just a couple of days ago was that Andrew Scheer, leader of the uh, Conservative Party of Canada and uh, opposition, has chosen to resign um, when a leadership debate is held, allowing somebody else to take the reins. Uh, your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I'm not too surprised that uh, Andrew Scheer resigned. I'm surprised, or rather, the way the story has unfolded, uh, given the reason uh, that uh, was immediately put out by uh, the party, uh, why he resigned. Uh, I mean, we knew that uh, soon after the election, the long knives will come out. People uh, within the party uh, uh, would be very, very uh upset and and would want to change and would want to know why an election that should have been won by all accounts uh was lost and so i expected that change to happen and that change would have happened if there had been uh going into um the spring convention i uh, imagine that's what what the date was <clears throat> but the manner in which he resigned and the story that came out raises a whole lot of question the idea that was put out, or the, the reason that was put out was uh, that the Conservative National Fund, uh, the party fund to which um, the rank and file Conservative contribute uh, their money, uh, $25, $50, whatever, $100, and, and the corporate donors, that money from that fund was used to pay for Andrew Shear's children going to private school. And that was then subsequently uh, uh, given leg by the uh, letter that was sent out by the executive director, Dustin Van Roop, that uh, this was all okay because it was signed off by the party brass, uh, the people around uh, Andrew Shear, among whom was the executive director himself who had signed it off. And so there was nothing wrong or nothing improper uh, in, in the payment uh, arrangement that was made for Andrew Shear's four children. I believe he has five children. The fifth is very young to go to school. So it was the four children and that they were moved from uh, Saskatoon to Ottawa into a private course, school. There's, there's nothing wrong with a Conservative Party, which is a private organization when one comes down to it, uh, paying their leader whatever they choose, in whatever way they choose. So there's nothing wrong with that, though the optics are certainly bad. Right, the optics, the optics. And, and, and that, the fact that that was given as an excuse uh, is, is very interesting. Um, it could possibly be by making that into an excuse that uh, uh, Andrew Scheer did not fully think through the implication of dipping into the conservative fund to pay for his children's private schooling uh, is the reason why he's stepping down, mm -hmm. that it, the optics is unethical, improper. Uh, of course, um, also, you, if you recall, Stephen Harper the Conservative Party paid for his personal groomer. Right, right, so. exactly. Well, I, I, I do believe, Robert, I mean, neither neither of us have any insight into these uh, matters. These are all in that domain of uh, leadership uh, circle uh, and, and the people who work for the leader or the leader's office uh, engaging in these things. Uh, that there is a fund made available for the leader in terms of his uh, uh, personal requirements. Uh, and I suppose one can make an allowance for that uh, because the leader not only represents uh, himself, but if he becomes a prime minister or the leader of the opposition, he's representing Canadians across the land. And in the age that we live in, um, <coughs> the leader has to be seen as someone with the gravitas, at least the appearance of the gravitas in uh, uh, what he wears and how he presents himself or herself. So I think that allowance can be made. But the point that I'm driving at is that this story was given the main focus that uh, Andrew Scheer stepped down because of what is seen, uh, the optics of it, that uh, he had dipped into the conservative funds 
for his children's education and the private education. And obviously, again, just, just not to extend this too much, there is this, this um, appearance and now the reality that there is one set of rules, one set of agreement, one set of law for the elite uh, and then the other set for the people, you and I and all of us. Uh, and, and that doesn't play good. And uh, we have seen that on the, on the liberal side. Uh, there's completely you know, two set of laws, one for Justin Trudeau and, and the Liberal Party members and, and, and parliamentarians. Uh, and then uh, uh, for the rest of the Canadians. So, so that, that was it. But I have a feeling and I have a suspicion that this goes much deeper down. Uh, that the resignation or, or the notice of the resignation uh, that Andrew Scheer rose up in the parliament and announced it, uh, coming in the week when there is that uh, uh, Maxim Bernier and his lawyer, Andrew Maran's letter to uh, Warren Kinsella, uh, is also going through, uh, uh, I believe, uh, the first part of the case for defamation and the libel suit. Um, and if that case does end up in the court, then there will be discovery and, and the question will then emerge and people will get to know as this case drags on the extent to which uh, the Conservative Party under Andrew Scheer, Andrew Scheer himself and the people around him were directly involved in this uh, mm -hmm. dirty trick uh, the hiring of a liberal fixer, as notorious as Warren Kinsella is, and to use Warren Kinsella and his uh, law company, uh, Daisy Cactus, to mount this uh, smear campaign against uh, Maxim Bernier and the PPC, that uh, Maxim is a racist, uh, he's anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, and all the people around him, the PPC, uh, which did very serious damage to um, both Maxime and the party when it had not an iota, not a scintilla of truth in it, you know. Yes. Um, so uh, I think those things will come out. There's, there's the announcement that uh, uh, after the resignation uh, was went public that uh, the uh, governors of the Conservative Fund or the Board of Directors or whatever they're called, the Governing Council, uh, they asked Justin Van Gogh to step down and he was removed from his position as the executive director of uh, the party. We, by the way, haven't heard about Hamish Marshall because, I mean, these are the people around uh, Andrew Scheer. Possibly Hamish Marshall is also gone or will be going away. And that there's going to be a forensic audit of the conservative funds, you know. So that might lead to the question of, what the money came out of the conservative fund to smear Maxim Bernier by hiring uh, uh, Warren Kinsella. So I now, think I think they are in, in, in quite a bit of a mess on this matter. I'm, I'm reminded that, first of all, there has to be a leadership race to replace Scheer. And just before we started recording this, you were mentioning to me how likely it could be that Justin Trudeau might call an election in the middle of such a a debate which I think would be perfectly in character for that man, considering that uh, at the election, on the night of the election, Andrew Scheer's concession speech was interrupted by Justin Trudeau. Absolutely zero grace from that man. So I think the uh, Conservative Party better get, get cracking really quick on choosing a new leader because Justin Trudeau is going to take advantage of that and uh, probably call an election right in the middle of their of their debate. But, but speaking of that, there's a list of potential candidates to replace Andrew Scheer, and I've got it in front of me here. That, just let's go down the list and see what you think about them regarding their policies, because uh, regardless of the people and, and how, how well they may do in as a leader of the Conservative Party, it's their policies that you and I always talk about um, because the Conservative Party has been uh, pushed back into the centre of, um, if not left, left of centre policy in Canadian politics. And 
the list of people I see here in front of me as hopefuls to take over the Conservative Party are, in my estimation, except for the exception of perhaps one of them, and I'll get into that, um, left of centre, if not elitist, outright elitist. Um, so let's just go down the list. Uh, you got Brad Wall. What do you think of Brad Wall and his chances and his policies? Well, again, uh, Brad Wall, um, a former, former Premier of Saskatchewan, coming from the same background, uh, provincially, uh, Andrew Shear. Uh, Brad Wall's uh, position as a defender of uh, provincial uh, rights and provincial interests, especially Western Canada, where their alienation is uh, becoming a serious problem, rising in terms of Canada federal provincial relationship, um, is an automatic automatic uh, choice in the sense of being on the list. Uh, but I believe that Brad Wall has indicated that he's not going to run, uh, that he's not interested, he has gone into the private sector, and um, he's not ready to come back into the public. So uh, I don't know whether there will be arm twisting about him, but uh, that's one factor. The other factor is I don't know whether Brad Wall is um, competent and efficient in the uh, French language. Uh, that is, of course, one of the requirements in that leadership position in Canada. So um, <clears throat> while his profile is attractive in that sense, uh, I don't think he's a small C conservative. Uh, again, the matter is very much on the federal provincial relationship and a defense of Western interests in terms of natural resources and the needs for the West to get those national resources out into the country and then out into the world. So if he does come in, he would be uh, an important player in getting that debate going forward, you know, and he yes. would have a lot of support in the West. Yeah, it's but interesting I, you say that he's saying that he's not interested because Andrew Scheer was saying just a few short weeks ago, right after the election, that he's going to stay on. And then, of course, he doesn't. So, I mean, when a politician says he's not interested, I don't give it any credence. We'll wait till see. <laughs> Christy Clark. Christy Clark, former Bre B uh, Premier of B British Columbia, has also been bandied about as a, as a potential. What do you think? I, I, I don't see she has any, any uh, gravitas, any weight. You know, uh, her record as in British Columbia was one marked with quite a bit of controversy uh, between her trying to negotiate between the NDP over there with the progressive politics and what she stood for. So um, I think the only reason that she might have some traction is again, the gender politics. We have become so fixated now, uh, both nationally and in particular uh, with the Conservative Party because they won't, don't want to see to be in any way politically incorrect. That's one of the things that we need to talk about, about Andrew Scheer. Yeah. How about um, Aaron O'Toole? He, re he came in third in the past leadership debate behind Scheer and Maxime Bernier. Yes, I think he's a dark horse. I, I think he would be a stalking da dark horse. He has uh, that military background in the Air Force. He was a navigator. And so he might carry some uh, seriousness on the issue of uh, where is Canada on its defense commitment. I mean, that is a that is one of the top issues during uh, uh, President Trump's uh, 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 role in, in Washington. President Trump has uh, the leader of the free world or of NATO alliance. So uh, Canada is uh, not not uh, at all up to the mark where President Trump wants to see all the NATO allies uh, stepping forward and meeting their commitment of 2% of the GDP in terms of defense spending. So Aaron Tool might carry some weight on that issue, but beyond mm -hmm. that, I don't see any special characteristic. How about Rona Ambrose? She comes out in a number of polls as being a front runner in the debate. Now, of course, she was the former leader of the opposition after being interim leader for a while. And I notice in her bio, she has a, a Bachelor of Arts in Women's and Gender Studies. So she'll fit right in with the elitist, centrist, progressive, conservative ilk, wouldn't she? Yeah, I mean, um, She's a very attractive woman uh, in every sense of the word. I don't mean simply uh, her appearance and her uh, presence uh, on, on in the public platform. 
Uh, she's also very um, articulate. She is fluently bilingual, I understand. I think she's uh, in the bilingual in Portuguese, isn't she? Or is, am I con confusing her with some, someone else? I think she, she, she is of a Portuguese background. Brazilian, uh, yeah. Yeah. But what she carries with her, with her is um, in, in, in terms of her attraction or, and her appeal uh, is she's a woman, she's articulate, uh, she f will fill all the boxes, mark all the boxes in terms of gender, in terms of uh, progressive, you know, uh, and she will then be in a position, uh, if she is the leader, she'll be in a position to really take the fight to uh, our great feminist uh, leader, Prime Minister uh, Justin Trudeau. She calls herself a feminist, and she was a minister of women's, uh, what was that, women's portfolio. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But she's also, I mean, this, this I think should need to be underscored. Uh, she's very much a Harper uh, person, Harper, Jason Kenney, uh, soon after. Uh, the news of Andrew Scheer came out. Jason Kenney was already touting um, uh, Rona Ambrose as the most attractive candidate for the leadership. And if she runs, I think she will have the edge going into it. She will be because she already has marked out her position as an interim leader when uh, Harper stepped down after the 2015 election. So I think she was there for about a year and a half, if not more. It is at that time that she signed that she would be the interim leader, but would not run for the leadership. Which is typical at the, for an interim leader, yes. A, a typical, a, an interim leader typically says and declares that they will not vie for the leadership at that time. Yeah, just as a matter of courtesy. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, but, but then uh, uh, somebody stepping in, for being an interim leader and signing off for making that commitment, uh, or meeting that requirement that they wouldn't be running for the leader, uh, begs the question, uh, why did she do that? Uh, why did she step forward to be the interim leader and write off the possibility of actually running for the leadership? Uh, begs the question in the sense that possibly uh, she wanted to get out of politics again like Brad Walls, she had been in politics the entire decade with uh, Harper. That was the decade of conservative government. And so it was time for her to leave to meet her other needs, both as a woman and as a family and so on and so forth. So um, that that will hang upon, the, uh, that, that question hangs whether she is a serious candidate that she will commit herself to come back. Car Carolyn Mulrooney, uh is also a, a possible name that's been thrown around, and yet that's all Canada needs is another dynasty, isn't it? Another <laughs> chip off the old block, so to speak, from Brian Mulrooney. Um, we already see what Justin Trudeau is like compared to his father, and uh, if you want to talk about elitist, or at least coming from the elitist fold, Carolyn Mulrooney would be it, wouldn't you think? Yeah, absolutely. And she just stepped into her role as the Attorney General in Ontario and uh, stepping into politics. Um, she tried the leadership in the Ontario Progressive Conservative Party. She did not get ahead on that one, uh, but she got elected and she is now serving in the Ford administration and in Ontario. So I think for her to jump from there on to the federal scene would be too demonstrative of her uh, ambition and opportunism. And I don't think... So she'd be perfect then? Yeah, it, it will not necessarily play good. But uh, yeah. again, uh, you, you're quite right. I mean, here, here are we are we getting into a sit situation of, of dynastic politics, which was, which was not part of Canadian political history. I can't recall. This is the first time that we have a son of a former prime minister as prime minister, and would we then have the daughter of a former prime minister headed out to be the leader of the opposition with the possibility of being a future prime minister? So I think those things might raise a lot of hackle. Uh, yeah. uh, on the other hand, the elite is too confident that they can manage all of these things if they're serious about it.
I think that's the definition of elite, isn't it? Now, what about Peter McKay, former leader of the Progressive Conservatives? You, uh, of course, know uh, Peter quite well in the sense that um, when the Canadian Alliance joined with the Progressive Conservatives, Canadian Alliance under Stephen Harper, um, well, Stephen Harper was eventually chosen as a Conservative leader, but Peter McKay was the leader of the Progressive Conservatives. Are we going to, I mean, if he gets to be leader, aren't we going full circle? again, coming right back to where we started from in the uh, conservative movement? I think so. I think Peter has always been in that sense since uh, the 2003 convention of the Unite the Right when Peter chose to uh, move forward in uh, uniting uh, uh, the Progressive Conservative Party with the Canadian Alliance to form the Conservative Party of Canada. Uh, he has always, in that sense, while he was in politics before stepping down in 2015, going into the private sector, always seen as a putative leader, a potential leader uh, or a successor to Stephen Harper. Um, so he left in 2015. Would he come back in 2020? Um, I think Peter never gave up his ambition to be the prime minister. I, my own feeling about Peter is that he saw himself as a future prime minister. He has served all the key portfolios. He was the attorney general. He was a defense minister. What else did he play? Justice. Uh, so he he has gone around the circle. He has been the senior most cabinet member. Uh, and um, the, the, uh, the, the possibility of Peter stepping forward, I think, is quite real. Um, he will also play shy and coy uh, about whether he wants to come back, as you pointed out about Brad, Brad Wall, when, I, when somebody said that they're not interested, they're testing the water. Um, but he does have a young family. And um, I think his wife would have quite a bit of say in the matter. Uh, she herself are quite an ambitious uh, woman a very attractive lady, uh, Iranian, by the way. I don't know if many of the Canadians know about that. Uh, she, she's of Iranian origin, and I think she was Miss Wo had competed in Miss World or Miss Universe. So uh, in, in, in all of that sense, she's a very uh, attractive person. Uh, so she will have something to say about whether Peter runs or not. But I think Peter, Peter if he runs, will have the inside edge, my sense of it is, because we have gone from uh, two leaders of the Conservative Party in this new incarnation of the Conservative Party of Canada from the West, uh, Stephen Harper and Andrew Scheer, and the elites, uh, the rulers in the Conservative Party might well consider that it is time for an Easterner to come in. You know, we haven't had uh, an Easterner if my mind goes back, we haven't had in the Conservative Party leadership an Easterner uh, that is from the Maritime since Robert Stanfield. Yes, yeah. Nova Scotia, too, wasn't he? Peter McKay is Nova Scotia, and Stanfield was also Nova Scotia, wasn't he? No, I mean, if you're talking about the leadership of the of the progressive conservative, I mean, mm. as a precursor to the Conservative Party, you had Robert Stanfield, who was replaced by uh, Joe Clark, who was replaced Calgary, by Brian yeah. Tony. Yeah. And Brian Maroney was, well, was a Quebecer, uh, and then you have uh, what you call um, Stephen Harper. I mean, the interim between Brian Maroney and Stephen Harper was the Reform Canadian Alliance period, and then you have Stephen Harper and mm -hmm. then uh, Andrew Scheer. So I think there will be be a uh, a pull for Peter McKay on that side of the argument. And the fact that the Conservative Party has not been able to break grounds in the maritime, you know, it couldn't break grounds uh, in 2019, couldn't break grounds in 2015, barely had a show uh, during the Harper years, uh, uh, 2006, 2015. So the hope would then be hope burns eternal in the heart of man and especially in the heart of the conservative party too <laughs> that's right and so uh peter peter would be the hope for yeah. making that critical breakthrough in the in the maritime 
one person that stands out in my mind because I, I've watched him in the debates in the House of Commons and um, he really shines, I have to say, as Pierre Polliver, from, uh, an MP from Carleton, Ontario, and uh, he can really hold his own on the floor of the House. What do you think of him? He's a dark horse. I mean, I like him too in the sense that he's feisty. Mm -hmm. I think he's the only, only front bench uh, conservative member who has demonstrated his feistiness with being able to take the fight to uh, the Liberals, to Justin Trudeau, and who will not back down. So, plus he's bilingual, you know, and um, in, that, in that sense, he possibly could be the stalking horse if he comes into the race. Uh, he's also from Ottawa, so he's from the heart of Canada, you know, and, and central Canada. He meets both the criteria. He's francophony in that sense, and um, he, he has pretty well got a good command over the files that he has been dealing with, finance, hmm. economics, uh, and also, to some extent, uh, domestic issue and foreign policy. So yes, I think he would be a, a, a dark horse, but a, but a strong, strong candidate. Yeah, and here we are talking about who's fit or the possible hopefuls to lead the Conservative Party of Canada. And yet you and I have talked recently about how the Conservative Party is basically um, probably never going to get the reins of power ever again in Canada, given the makeup of the, the country and how the Conservatives are, are, have turned liberal light and have gone back to the Conservatives pre-Canadian Alliance days, especially with, under Andrew Scheer. Now, Maxime Bernier almost won the leadership of the uh, Conservative Party, and yet when he lost, he said that, uh, just recently, he said that he was glad he lost because he did not have the support of the party um, um, in caucus. Five members of the Conservative caucus supported him. So he said he would never have been able to lead that party, which he said is morally and intellectually corrupt. So talking about a Peter McKay, Carolyn Mulroney, Totul, Ambrose, or whatever, leading such a corrupt, both morally and intellectually and politically, uh, party seems almost like a, a moot point. It's debatable, but at the, in the end of the, at the end of the day, unless you get somebody with such a char charismatic uh, persona, you're never going to see a conservative party government in Canada again. What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. In fact, I, I in saying that uh, in this period um, leading up to the election of October, um, as many, many of uh, the people who might tune in to listen to us, many of them might know that I, I was a member of the Conservative Party for quite some time going all the way back to early 1990s, I voted for the Conservative Party in 84, 88. And then I was disallowed by Andrew Scheer, and that's a story, you know, I don't want to make it into personal, but objectively looking at that's a story that, that, that can be brought into this discussion. I'll hold back on it for the moment. Um, <clears throat> uh, the, so so uh, the issue that you're talking about, um, the nature of the Conservative Party and what uh, Maxim Bernier said that the party is politically and morally or morally and politically corrupt has a lot of truth in it. In fact, I think now we can say very clearly, this is the way I would put it, um, uh, Robert, there's not an issue of uh, being charismatic um, or, or having a public appeal and a persona. Um, Brian Mulroney had all of that gift, you know, uh, and he was able to win two massive majorities in, in 84 and 88. Uh, it has nothing to do with all of that. It is to understand structurally uh, and politically in terms of ideas um, and policy that the Conservative Party is a party which is the spare wheel of the Laurentian elite, of the establishment elite's contraption that runs Canada. 
It is a spare wheel in the back of the trunk of the car. When the car has a flat wheel, that is the Liberal Party goes clunker for any number of reasons. You know, the long decades of the Trudeau years when people people were, you know, uh, getting edgy with the Liberal Party. Uh, then you needed to get the spare wheel out. Uh, one and of those little donut wheels, eh? Not one of the regular tires, but a donut wheel. A that's right. That, wheel. Yeah, that, that's what it is. So the Conservative Party structurally is that. I mean, we can we can go in and discuss it. You know, um, I have talked about, and, and let me remind that we can break down Canadian politics uh, and Canadian history that is of the Dominion. 1867 to now where we are heading into 2020 into 50 year packages so 1867 till the uh, world war one uh, 1917 50 year package then 1917 to 1967 67 was the centenary year um so the second and you can see the ups and downs of canadian politics in the context of those uh, situation both domestically and in terms of world affairs and then from 67 onwards now uh, where we are in the 50 years uh, so if you take these 50 years you know you can see that the conservative leadership going back to Robert Stanfield who replaced uh, John Deefen Baker uh, and so he was the leader during the centenary year uh, and, and Pierre Trudeau came to office in the 1968 uh, election Robert Stanfield was a spare wheel. Uh, there was not much of a fight. They went along, basically agreed to everything that was put on the on the table on the basis of the elite consensus. That is, the Montreal, Ottawa, Toronto triangle uh, that has run this country, uh, and more particularly in the last fifty years, which has increasingly become a unitary state. Uh, Canada is a federation and the centralization that has taken place to direct Canada and all the way into the Prime Minister's office and the Prime Minister. So um, oh, the, the Conservative Party had just been the spare wheel. I can't uh, change your government, uh, right? I'm Pardon told, me? You once told, uh, told me that uh, in the last 90 years, there's only been four Conservative majority governments. And even in those four majority Conservative governments, they've only acted like caretaker governments, just keeping the seat warm for the Liberal Party, which some have called the um, natural ruling party of the country. Absolutely. Uh, not uh, in, the, in, the, in the last 90 years, it's not four majority governments, three majority governments. Three, is it? Very good. Uh, John Deefen Baker in 1957 to 63. Joe Clark was just a 10 minute, a 10, a 10 month stop gap measure, you know. Um, and then you had the Brian Mulroney uh, decade, uh, two majority governments uh, in the late 80s. Uh, and then uh, you had the whole of nine, the decade of the 90s that was again back again to the liberal. And then you had the decade with the Harper. I must have been going uh, back to R.B. Bennett, I think. Yeah, you, that, that goes before World War II, yeah. you know. Yeah, so, so yeah. But still exactly. within 90 years. Yeah, close to eh? it. To be more precise, you know, uh, Bennett government was 1930-1935. Those were the depression years. Um, and then came Mackenzie King and Mackenzie King from 35 on through the world to World War Two, 1939-1945, right into the 1950s. Yes. And then came Louis, Louis Saint Laurent. John Diefenbaker was after Louis Saint Laurent for that six years, 1957, 1963. And then you had Lester Pearson, his minority government, uh, 63, mm. 65, 68, and then... Right. But I think you know, the point is, though, that the conservative governments, whenever they do get an absolute majority to do basically whatever they want in this um, system of government that we have, um, do nothing. And we even talked about this. I don't know if we uh, put it on video or not, Salim, but you and I were talking about how even Stephen Harper's government, the conservative of conservatives, the bluest of Tories, according to some people, really did very little under his term um, 
under a majority government. Now, he used to say that, oh, I can't balance the budget now because the liberals won't approve it because we're in a minority situation. And so we have to give some stimulus spending here, even though as an economist, he hated stimulus spending. And yet when he comes to power, absolute power, what happened? Who can point out to him anything of substance that the conservatives did under Stephen Harper when he was in majority? Uh, absolutely. So to be a spare wheel means to be simply a manager. Yeah. <laughs> to to just provide uh, the skills to go over the bump, and then back again. You have the natural governing party, whether it is with a black face or a brown face, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> steps in uh, as, as as Justin Trudeau did, uh, and indeed, you know, and, uh, the, the Harper Harper decade was basically a, a management. There was nothing substantive in any way. Uh, that is, one can look back now and say, here was a conservative prime minister, and this is a conservative achievement. Uh, that, yeah. That's what happened, you know. This was the legislative uh, thing that stands out. Now, mind you. At the, at the, at the bottom line, uh, uh, Robert, uh, excuse me, um, we, we are now, we are doing a retrospective analysis. We are now very much clear. I mean, here you have the marker, Donald Trump in, in the White House, uh, more than 40 years after Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was up in the height of the Cold War. In fact, he's the man who won the Cold War against the evil empire, you know. This is this was the 30th anniversary this November of the fall of the Berlin Wall in November of 1989 and the end of the Cold War. And the, finally, you know, it was under his uh, vice president, as President George H.W. Bush, that Soviet Union eventually disintegrated and collapsed and went into the garbage can of history. Uh, but you have Donald Trump now. Uh, and then in, in England, you just had this election um, this past week. Boris Johnson, the conservative leader, uh, again, after 40 years uh, of Maggie Thatcher, that you have a true conservative government, a really conservative government that has done the house cleaning and will now do what what the election was all about in, in, in that very important sense, Brexit. And, and if we have time, we can talk about all of that and what it means. So in that context, with that backstory, that background, to look at the record of Canadian politics when it comes to conservatives and the natural governing party, the liberals, uh, as I've just now said, conservatives are the spare wheel in the Laurentian elite contraption. Uh, the struggle is cultural. There is a consensus, not simply of the governing elite, but about the management of the administrative state that has evolved in the last 50 years. In the United States, now with, with the Trump administration, we can see the fight is between the administrative state, which is the deep state trying to direct the affairs, despite the, the people's choice, in this case, Trump. You had the same situation in uh, Britain. Now we saw the administrative state, which is the deep state, the, the permanent unelected bureaucracy, you might say, uh, the, the media, the academia, that all combines together to form the deep state or the administrative state. Uh, you had the 2016 Brexit vote referendum, and yet it took almost three and a half years to have another election for Boris Johnson to do the cleaning of the house in the conservative side, to be able now to go forward and meet the challenges, first get Britain out of the European Union and then restructure the British uh, government uh, in terms of uh, the traditional values and, and what extent Boris Johnson is going to be able to succeed doing that. So in the case of Canada, it is a question of culture. It is a question of what does the Conservative Party understand that needs to be defended and to fight for in the case of the Canadian interest, the Canadian values, the Canadian tradition. And I would submit that as a spare wheel in the, in the, in the Laurentian elite contraption, the Conservative Party is a party that will not allow any of that discussion to take place. Mm -hmm. 
the whoever is the leader. And so there you had Harper, and now you may have whether it's Rona Ambrose or, or Peter McKay or whoever you flip the coin and come and, and, and becomes the leader uh, by the machination of the internal elite that control the conservative party, that leader will simply be an instrument to play the role of a manager. I mean, the, the, the guardrails of conservative politics is very clear, you know, and it's very, very clearly defined that the consensus that has been established by the Laurentian elite articulated by the liberal government and the liberal party is the one that you stick with. So what are the cultural issues over here in, in Canada? Take the case of Harper. He refused to even allow, even to have a discussion on a private member's motion in the conservative caucus on the question of the protection of the unborn. You know, the conservatives are supposed to be a, a party that places the sanctity of life or should place the sanctity of life right at the top as an axiomatic principle but it was not allowed and Harper would not. And the same thing was said by Andrew Scheer because that has been established in the Laurentian elite consensus. You know, so we have now since uh, 19, mid 1980s, there is no law. We are the only G7 country in the world that has no law on the protection of the unborn. It's an, it's an interesting issue because uh, the Liberal government and the Liberal Party has, has almost always taken the point of view is that whatever the polls say or indicate that people want, we'll give them. doesn't matter. And the polls have indicated over 60% of Canadians would like to see some sort of regulation on late-term abortions. And yet, nobody is even allowed to discuss it in Parliament. Exactly. So, so, so there it is. I mean, that, that, that would be philosophically, culturally, one of the most important issues should be, but it is not. It's not even allowed to be discussed. You, you, you take, uh, just from the top of my head, run a few of the other issues. Take the issue of multiculturalism. It is, after all, the progressive conservative prime minister who put it in the statute book. That's Brian no, Maroney. Yes. You know, it, it began with Pierre Trudeau, but there was no opposition from Robert Stanfield to it. They went along. So in a sense, the liberal leadership, the liberal party, the Laurentian elite, they moved the goalposts to the left to the right, but mostly to the left. They keep moving the goalposts to the left and the conservative party keeps coming two steps behind to defend that goalpost, okay. not to challenge it, not to dismantle it, but to defend it, you know, and to stop the people from discussing it. Take the immigration issue, which, which, which the PPC raised in this election. It has not been discussed. It will not be discussed. You know, in fact, the, the number... The minute you, that you discuss it, you're labeled a racist. The minute right. you open, use the word immigrant, you're a racist. You're a racist. So you have the situation, as we have pointed out, that it was, in fact, under the conservative prime minister, both Brian Mulroney and then Stephen Harper, that the actual numbers in terms of immigrants and migrants into the country went up, not under Justin Trudeau. Now Justin Trudeau has accelerated the process, but the numbers started moving uh, uh, and, and, and going up, escalating during, during the uh, uh, leadership and the government of two progressive conservative, progressive conservative and conservative prime minister. Mm -hmm. The critical issue that I'm driving at in the last 25 years, and we saw this play out in both the American election in 2016, the Brexit in 2016, the election in 2019 in the UK, and right across Europe, is the issue of globalism and the issue of Islamism. And in both those two issues, the conservative leaders are basically in line with the liberals and the NDP and the Green. There's a famous video that's going around of Andrew Scheer sitting down with Islamists, Sharia lovers and supporters and promoters, and basically taking their direction. 
Absolutely. That's what, that's what Hamish Marshall told me, conveyed to me directly, face to face, mm -hmm. that I have to leave. I have to get out. I was given 48 hour instruction to get out because I am an Islamophobe. That they were not going to discuss the issue of Islamism and they would not allow the discussion of issue of Islamism to take place during an election or even when there is no election that is in, 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 a, in a general situation. And then we saw Andrew Scheer going and sitting down with the Islamists yes. um, in, in the greater Toronto area as if by sitting down with the Islamists, they're going to win mm. the Muslim vote which they did not. But, but that was clearly, so there it is. I mean, the Liberal Party of Canada now is basically allied, hook, line and sinker with the Islamists and Islamism. And uh, another issue that the Conservatives have fallen down on, we've gone through three already or four, um, would be the economy. And you would think that uh, Conservatives would give you a fiscally responsible budget and yet when was the real, I mean, out of all of the years that Conservatives have been in power, mostly minority governments, how many balanced budgets did they ever give us? Yeah, I mean, in the election, there was no basic fight in, 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 in Andrew Scheer on those issues uh, about the budget, about the finance, about the rising, escalating uh, debt to the GDP ratio. You know, we are pretty much the highest among the G7 countries, or pretty close to becoming the highest among the G7 countries. But there was no serious discussion. There was no challenging uh, 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 of uh, the Liberal Party and what they have done to the economy, how, how they have busted it. They might raise the issue, they might point out the issue, but they haven't yet you know, said you know, what they would do. We said, the PPC said, the Maxim Bernier said, that that would be our laser-like focus at to to balance the budget in two years, to cut down expenditure. I mean, look, Harper had 10 years to demonstrate that he is serious about uh, balancing the budget and start cutting down uh, uh, spending by taking out, say, for instance, the funding of the CBC. Uh, this was an issue that went back to the Reform Party years, you know. Um, we now have um, uh, the numbers that the CBC viewership, we're talking about CBC television now, uh, CBC viewership is down to somewhere uh, in uh, 250, 270,000, you know, under 300,000. And yet we have this immense expenditure where we have long waiting lines in our hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, so why are we doing that? You know, and there was, there was, there was no effort on the part of Mr. Harper to take on some of these hard issues and cut down the spending. The, the spending on, on the um, side of uh, the United Nation and uh, uh, you know, developmental assistance around the world to buy for Canada a seat in the United Nations Security Council. You know, We said, that is the PPC said, Maxim Bernier said, we will cut down on all developmental assistance, except for humanitarian aid. Yeah. Our first priority will be expenditure domestically. We keep talking about native Canadian, the Aboriginal and, and, and the, the, the terrible situation uh, in terms of the needs of the Aboriginal people and to bring them up to the standards that the rest of Canada enjoys or takes for in a sense of entitlement. But we only talk about that Every time that, that an election comes around, you know, the Liberal Party is right up in front and then is the, is the, is the Conservative Party. And of course, you know, the Greens and the NDP talking about what we're going to do for the Aboriginal people, for the First Nation. Well, it is under these parties that the situation of the Aboriginal people for the 150 years has not made any substantive and qualitative change. Yes, I think perhaps it's just to... It's Bernier, it's not because of PPC. Yeah. So this is the elite party, this is the elite position, and they have run this country down to the ground when it comes to the Aboriginal people. I think perhaps to bring the, uh, the discussion to a close, Salim, I can probably conclude by saying that it doesn't matter who is chosen as the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada, because one, they probably will not get elected, 
And two, even if they did get elected and got a resounding majority, nothing will change. No, nothing will change. No. Nothing will change. They are the spare wheel, haven't broken out of uh, uh, creating an independent identity in, t in terms of, you know, taking a position that are the position that the conservatives have taken in our, you know, uh, the Anglo-American sphere, the English-speaking world, United States under Trump, now Britain. By the way, before we close off, I mean, let me point out to you on, on this critical point, you know, uh, between the time that Boris Johnson became the leader of the Conservative Party in the summer of 2019 and the election that came about last week, uh, the first December election in British history since World War I. So that is, that is symbolic and interesting. Um, one of the things that Boris Johnson did was to clean the parliamentary ranks of the Conservative Party in the in Westminster Minister of any Remainers. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, he, he made it very clear that if you are a Remainer, if you're not committed to Brexit, and if you're not going to stand up with the party on Brexit, which is about to be his party and his role, they had no place in it. And so his brother, Boris Johnson's brother, Joe Johnson, Joe, Joe, yeah. served as a cabinet minister under Theresa May, and was a parliamentarian with Boris Johnson, he resigned and he left because he was a Remainer. So if we use that parallel, in the 2017 leadership uh, of the Conservative Party, on the 13th ballot, the election was stolen by Andrew Shear's handlers for Andrew Shear by bringing in the uh, the cartel, the supply management people, the dairy farmers in Quebec, something around about between seven and 8,000 votes uh, to defeat uh, Maxime Bernier. And the difference was in bringing in those votes at the last minute was uh, less than a, uh, it was a fraction of 1%. I mean, Bernier had something like 49 point uh, zero five percent of the vote, and uh, uh, Andrew Shear got fifty point nine percent of the vote, and 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 that was the difference under one percent. So where are the people, the forty nine percent of the Conservative Party members, have they left the Conservative Party because there is no hope in the Conservative Party. The people who remain in the Conservative Party, so the list of the names that you ran down, whether it's Rona Ambrose, whether it's Peter McCabe, whether it's Pierre Polyver, or whoever else that's come from the rank, Candice Bergen, that's one name that was, um, that you could have mentioned, uh, the, the woman from Manitoba, the a member from Manitoba, who I believe had been the deputy leader, but then Andrew Shear appointed Leona Alexiev, who was a liberal who crossed the floor. And there you have it, uh, a liberal now who is sitting and or, or will be become the possibly the interim leader uh, once uh, Andrew Scheer does depart. Uh, they're all part of uh, that, that elite consensus within the Conservative Party, glad to play the role of being the spare wheel. Uh, they're not going to deal with the fundamental issue, which I defined as the two elephants in Canadian politics, globalism and Islamism. They're not going to touch it. They're not going to talk about it. And so, you know, they, they, this is going forward into time. Canadians have to decide whether they're going to keep voting for the Conservative Party under the illusion that this is a conservative party, an alternative to the Liberal Party. I think they have to realize, they have to wake up and smell the coffee. That the conservative party is a spare wheel. That's all it is. It's a spare wheel of the Laurentian elite in Canadian politics. Yes. Thank you, Salim. Thank you.